So uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's another day for death by PowerPoint. I'm more than happy to oblige. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to try and keep it so, uh, short and sweet so that uh, we have a lot of interactivity. Uh, just as a, a way of quick introduction, I'm Mukul Krishna. I'm the Senior Global Director for Digital Media at Frost & Sullivan. Way back in the 90s, I used to make documentary movies for Rupert Murdoch, and here I am today. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's been a very interesting market. There's this old Chinese saying, uh, may you live in interesting times, and this industry has been uh, nothing but interesting. Uh, especially when we look at you know, just the past few years and where we are going forward. And that is what we, Avni, my colleague and I, we are going to talk about today in terms of how we have seen the market evolve, uh, what is happening out there. Uh, we are going to do a best impression of Mythbusters and um, uh, see where it goes from there. So <clears throat> uh, this is the ecosystem as we look at it. Uh, I've got a team of people uh, we have been, uh, most of us is, well, have worked in the market and then you know, we love the entire ecosystem so much. Uh, we've all sort of banded together to see how we can uh, provide a lot of uh, uh, our input, our analysis and uh, help with the market's uh, continued uh, evolution. Uh, this is how we look at it from creation to consumption, both on the enterprise side as well as on the media entertainment side. Uh, how many of you are more interested on the enterprise side rather than the media and entertainment side? Quick show of hands. I guess then how many of you are interested in the media and entertainment side, everyone? Okay, great. So I, I can tailor everything accordingly. Uh, but before I start, another very, very quick uh, poll. Uh, how many of you are technology providers? And how many of you are content providers? Perfect. So there's a little bit for everyone. Um, Make, if there's something, a burning question, just ask us. Um, I've been with the market for years and years and decades. So if there's anything at all that we have not covered, uh, you know where we live. So, and I'm here all day, Avni's here all day, so we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, <clears throat> let's uh, put everything in context. I mean, if we look at 2000, we had 19% of the global population that, had, that were some for, so, sort of mobile subscribers, and we had around 11% that was, uh, um, uh, they, they were using the internet. Uh, today, we've got around 67% of the world's population that is subscribing to some sort of mobile service, and we have got uh, around a third, close to, of the world's population that is online. Those are staggering numbers. Um, and what we are seeing now is, uh, uh, this, this digital content explosion and, uh, and all of the convergence. I mean, you've got content from every possible uh, aspect of our life going through ubiquitous networks to all of this device proliferation with a lot of interactivity now. Um, but that is just a starting point. Um, we are seeing the lines between who really is a service provider, content creator, uh, content owner, device maker. They, they, that's all blurring right now. Uh, we are all content creators. If you have a smartphone, we, we definitely are content creators. We're constantly creating content uh, um, uh, from video to um, um, uh, all sorts of images or textual content, you name it. Everyone has it. Uh, social media has transformed how content is distributed. And now <coughs> uh, the need to make that content uh, time-shifted, device-shifted, uh, uh, space, uh, 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 space shifted as well as doing all of that, not just on demand, but also live. That is becoming uh, one of the big challenges right now. It's a very fragmented market, extremely fragmented market, and that's, uh, uh, that's an understatement. Um, we are looking at a lot of consolidation activity right now in the market, uh, a lot of partnerships uh, moving towards acquisitions happening. A uh, lot of uh, siloed disparate systems, and we're going to focus a lot on that point, but this slide sort of sums up what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, there's a big need to have content portability across uh, multiple screens. Uh, cloud access for content and collaboration has become a huge buzzword right now, but what does that really mean? And then we're looking at a highly interactive and seamless consumer experiences. 
uh, and uh, trying to get a lot of targeted content as well as advertising. But there is a reason for going down all of this. And the reason being, a lot of us have uh, typically focused on North America. Uh, there is a lot of growth also happening globally. Uh, in, uh, some of the sessions, a lot of people have talked about how they're seeing a lot of growth. But th this becomes very telling. There are more people living in that little circle than outside. And that, those are where we are seeing, the, they traditionally call them low ARPU countries, but uh, we have been having a lot of summits in that region. And one of the things, I mean, the way that market is transforming, a year and a half back when I was speaking over there, I was on my soapbox talking about TV everywhere, OTT, and they're like, yeah, yeah, it's not very contextual for this market, nice to know. Six months, eight months later when I was again speaking at a similar summit, uh, uh, the same, uh, exactly the same executives came up and said, oh, by the way, what you said eight months back, we're really hurting, we can't compete on price anymore. Uh, we have to differentiate based on quality of service, quality of experience. Uh, our bottom lines are hemorrhaging. How do we do OTT? Our OTT strategy is right now having a YouTube channel. And uh, we'll go through some very, very telling case studies as we go through today and uh, see where that pain point really is and how the vendor community can really come together with the uh, provider community and figure out how can we really move forward. Uh, one of the first case studies is about this regional network broadcaster, you know, four channels primarily in South Asia, US, Singapore, Malaysia, UAE. Um, so the, the distribution of, I know this is very text heavy, um, and I had that because I wanted everyone to move, go away with a lot of context. Uh, we'll make these all available, obviously, so you can all read it at your leisure. But in a nutshell, uh, they didn't have any centralized content management platform. Every piece of content required four or five steps individually uh, to transform the content, uh, you know, manually transcoding it in separate formats, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the company often considered, you know, should it be buying its uh, uh, a solution, should it build it in-house, which would be the best way to go about it. It's not as if they didn't have technology. So when we talk about, oh, the digital transformation of the market, uh, I think we are far from it. A lot of people have acquired technology, but that's why, you know, what, now what? What do I do? I'm still at square one. My margins are still razor thin. What do I really need to do? Uh, what, for example, this particular uh, CSP really needed was an efficient and pervasive management system that would integrate all of these traditionally siloed and disparate pieces together. Um, uh, and they have been struggling massively trying to achieve that because, uh, as I said, there's no dearth in technology, but how do you deploy it? How do you implement it? They have a strategy, but they have not been able to figure out uh, how to work with the vendor community to provide that sort of a uh, strategy. Uh, then, you know, you're also looking at a one-size-fits-none. Again, an Asian division of one of the largest broadcast networks in the world. Um, uh, 40 channels, uh, seven languages, 600 million people. That's their uh, uh, viewership in over 100 countries. Uh, their um, OTT strategy for the longest time has been YouTube, especially for that region. It's appalling. Um, uh, for, uh, they've been using a lot of different content management systems also, but nothing is tied together. Uh, they require uh, content ret retrieval from very disparate sources, internal, external, being able to transform that content. Um, uh, ad insertion is huge. Uh, rights management, uh, there are so many different types of services m across multiple regions. They have to take care of all of that. And they also want insight about the viewership, especially in an OTT setting. Uh, all of these actions today, they are working as isolated functions with a very, very high degree of manual intervention, right? Uh, in, in trying to ensure high quality delivery across all of these channels, uh, that is a, one of the biggest critical challenges. And it, it's, it's not as if they're a small company, they don't have money and stuff like that. And yes, I can throw as much money as I want at a problem and it'll go away, but then why? If the returns I'm getting are not uh, uh, greater than um, uh, the cost of trying to solve the challenge. And uh, that's where a lot of people are trying to tie the dots. Again, another pay TV network in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, offering nearly 140 channels, a uh, lot of different genres. Uh, it's trying to digitize all of its legacy content. 
and they've not been able to successfully figure out what sort of a distribution platform they can take online. So what they ended up doing was creating these five to 10 minute clips and uh, uh, trying to uh, distribute it through uh, popular user-generated sites. Uh, what they want to do is create their own online portal. They do have a media asset management solution, but it, again, it is used as a point solution, which is, again, one very, very critical thing that we have seen. Most of the solutions right now being deployed are being sold as point solutions. They're being used as point solutions. Uh, today, the disparate nature of the workflow has not let the company benefit from its TV Everywhere um, uh, initiatives. So uh, yes, there is a lot of technology proliferation, but it is being underutilized. And that, again, is a big understatement. And uh, let's look at the traditional pay TV ecosystem. That's what we are dealing with. It's complex as it is, but we have done a pretty fair, decent job of trying to solve this problem. Add to it when you're trying to go OTT and especially via cloud, and suddenly you're looking at this very different ecosystem, the thing is both of them have to work together. But right now we have uh, both from a vendor perspective traditionally, and there are a lot of people who have taken that leap, but predominantly we are looking at people working in isolation. I'm going to only solve your OTT side. I'm only going to solve this. I'm only going to solve that. And from a, a CSP's perspective, uh, they're coming to that point, they can't do that anymore. In fact, I'm not going to name them. They're one of the largest content owners in the world. We were talking to them. They're very, very frustrated about, and especially when they're trying to do uh, live linear as well, not just on demand, all over the top. Uh, they were so frustrated, they said maybe, uh, uh, and he was uh, half kidding, half serious because the chuckle was sort of evil. Uh, he goes, maybe I need to, uh, we need to invest in starting our own ML BAM type service. So here we are talking about CSPs who are saying, you know, maybe enough is enough. Maybe we need to just uh, take full ownership and do our own thing. And that is something obviously the vendor community does not want, and frankly, they don't want to do it either. They, uh, their business is content, they want to focus on that. Uh, you've got a very vibrant vendor community that, though fragmented, is so innovative. Uh, they know what they're doing best. Uh, so we've, we've, next couple of slides, uh, and we have never, ever published this because it's always, always going to be taken out of context. Either people are going to hate me after that, people are going to love me after that. So I'm trying to provide context today. <clears throat> So if you're taking pictures of this, please say, hey, there is context associated with it. Don't just uh, start sticking pins in a voodoo doll. Um, so if we look at, um, uh, this is one really quick way of looking at what the uh, market landscape looks like from a vendor community standpoint. Uh, you've got uh, all different types of solutions that come together to enable that entire workflow. Uh, it's just a different way of representing this previous slide where we are looking at that from an end-to-end -end perspective. But what is more telling is um, uh, all of them are trying to get together to come to, and I'm sorry I'm running through some of that because I know you already know a lot of this. Uh, feel free to stop me if you want me to uh, spend more time on something. Uh, but um, we're looking at that end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, despite how fragmented this is, uh, the holy grail, so to speak, is trying to get to this uh, very, very integrated platform that lets me not only handle the asset level activities that includes content transformation and management and all of that, but also helps me with my uh, 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 business level activities in terms of uh, 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 contract management in terms of uh, billing, in terms of uh, actual delivery and um, uh, creating a business model using analytics, uh, uh, tying it to metadata at the front end. And the reason for that we'll be coming to very, very soon. Um, and here is the, the slide that always, uh, I'm, this is actually this is the first time we're uh, showing this in public because uh, it always would get us into hot water otherwise. So the way we've tried to segment the market, uh, you have very business-focused solutions going down to very technology-focused solutions. You have very holistic solutions to very atomistic solutions. Uh, not, there is no good or bad. There is uh, nothing magical about this. I mean, it's just one way of looking at the market. 
uh, uh, whichever way uh, you are looking at it, every single aspect is very, very important. Uh, and I don't want to leave it at that. I'm going to, and Avni and I, we both are going to call out uh, vendors as we speak going forward. Uh, because yeah, we don't want to anonymize anything. Uh, anyone that we have talked about, no one has paid us to talk about them. We might be talking good or bad. Um, but so if you look at some of the more technology focused companies, uh, more atomistic or hardware centric, we're looking at like the Sony, Toshiba, so Panasonic, and I'm just using this as a representative example. It's not necessarily uh, uh, going to uh, uh, talk about everyone. And many of these companies have also, uh, literally every week they move. And Avni will also be getting into more details about how we have seen that movement. Um, then we are looking at companies such as uh, uh, Telestream, uh, uh, AWS, Wowza, and Vipio that are trying to be more holistic with the current offering, but again, very technology and delivery focused. Uh, then we are looking at uh, companies such as uh, Apple, Grace, Note, Comcast that are very, very business focused. Uh, but still, it is more in terms of a very atomistic, more, more, um, um, uh, more of a closed ecosystem. And then we get into uh, uh, companies that are uh, now increasingly uh, much more holistic, more software, more cloud-based, and very, very business focused. And there are a couple of them uh, right there that Avni is going to get into that were very, very atomistic in technology and delivery focused literally a year back. And within seven, eight months, they are right up there. Again, there is no right place to be. Every aspect of this grid is important to the ecosystem. But why we are seeing that uh, convergence in that upper right-hand corner is that is where most of the market conversations are going right now, right? Uh, why they're going into that right now, uh, we, uh, uh, someone croaked um, uh, a few moons back and uh, I was asked to chair a CIO summit for m and &E executives. And uh, as part of that, I was also running a workshop for them and uh, literally everyone was there. And uh, as I tried to distill down what everyone was saying in that workshop, these are largely the four buckets where they're looking at investing the most. Content management is very, very fundamental. And not as a point solution, but as a very per pervasive solution uh, from creation all the way down to consumption. And there's a reason for that, because then you're also managing the metadata. And that becomes that much more important in a couple of minutes. Uh, for them, you're dead on arrival if you're not doing this. Everything is foundational, it's basic, uh, uh, it starts from there. Then I need to be on the maximum amount of screens, so content transformation. Uh, you've probably heard Avni uh, uh, talk very eloquently over the years around uh, the need for transcoding and how can you build a better mousetrap around that so that the entire encoding transcoding part gets over there. Uh, well, now that I'm getting it onto multiple screens, I need to protect my revenue stream, hence protecting my content. Uh, so uh, content protection in all its uh, different flavors, um, uh, DRM, conditional access, forensics, watermarking, you name it. And then you get down to content monetization. Usually the knee-jerk reaction for content monetization is, aha, analytics. Analytics is extremely critical, but not the only thing, and that's where we get into uh, I need my metadata being managed throughout the content lifecycle uh, because then I'm able to tie it, marry it to analytics at the front end. If I'm not doing that, I don't have the context to actually personalize and create a business model out of it. One of the reason, reasons why you can uh, think about uh, digital smiths getting acquired by TiVo. Uh, you really, really need to have that uh, context at uh, the front end to deliver those personalized services. And why we are talking a lot about that, we did this very, very extensive analysis in, uh, uh, for pay, uh, most of the pay TV providers, and frankly, all the OTT providers are also pay TV providers, uh, different form, but they are. The biggest challenge is churn. They're fighting that battle door to door, street to street, and it is almost entirely right now based on price and packaging, and largely price. 
Uh, and it's not just North America. We have also seen that, as I uh, told you, in Asia, where they're really, really hurting. I can't uh, keep competing on price. Where do I show growth? Um, what we have seen, and we went literally month by month, quarter by quarter, analyzing everything, uh, there are three things that they're going to be looking at investing the most in going forward. One is TV everywhere. Uh, the second is personalized discovery. And the third is home security or digital life solutions or the smarter home. Uh, let's talk about personalized discovery and TV everywhere. I really can only engage with people and get that going if I have that sort of capability uh, downstream and being able to translate that upstream and then going back, creating that loop where I'm constantly getting more personalized, more relevant for my subscriber, right? Uh, you have places uh, across the world, uh, Avni had a very good insight one time, uh, the remote control is always in English. Not everyone speaks that language. Uh, a lot of people are not even using EPGs. Uh, they don't have enough metadata. It is still by appointment television. The technology is there. It's not used. So when you are trying to create that sticky experience, when you are talking about, yes, I need to have that quality of experience, you have to figure out, okay, I need much better personalization. I need a much better user in interface. And what analytics will be providing then uh, uh, for me is being able to help target and uh, uh, content that is going to enhance that personalization. So they have to go hand in hand. Um, uh, again, uh, talking to a whole lot of uh, people across the globe, I mean, USA, Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Germany, Spain, UK, Russia, India, uh, we talk to media companies all across. Uh, over 90% said that their technology inventory will change moderately to significantly over the next three years. Um, most likely to be replaced, old analog and linear editing. Uh, there's still a lot of that, and uh, they're trying to get to uh, really nice NLE systems really fast. Transcoding digital asset management are, again, very, very key things. Uh, and that is, remember, just this that first uh, bucket that we talked about. Because many of them have now realized before they get to that ultimate price of I need to provide that sort of a personalized experience to reduce churn, to enhance my capabilities to earn more revenue, they have to first take care of the building blocks. Uh, I was doing a song and dance at NAB and uh, after I spoke, uh, this gentleman, uh, CTO of a major um, European broadcaster came up to me and he said, do you travel? I said, uh, well, I'm here. And he said, no, can you come to Europe with me? I said, why? He said, my board needs to hear what you just said. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Nothing is rocket science. I'm just stating the obvious. He said, you have no idea. Uh, so when we keep talking about transformation, I answer so telling when you, what do you really want? I, I, I love that quote. We would like to have a product that can capture, edit, manage all programs, resources, and commercials through one centralized box and multi-format compatibility. Yeah, that's not happening. Uh, that's, that's a pipe dream, if any. Uh, but uh, if you look at the concept behind it, why, uh, I mean, that was a very cathartic response to what is happening in the market. It's very fragmented. You keep trying to toy around with how do you bring all of these seemingly disparate and siloed solutions together. And frankly, uh, for most of them, they're still scratching their head. And now it's not even a, uh, a nice to have. It's a must have to survive. Uh, if you're not doing it, you're going to fail. If you, at least if you're doing it, you're increasing your probability to survive in the market. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, wet my throat a little bit. And Hopefully no one's going to trip over wires here for a second. There we go. All right. Not that right. All right, so um, this is just a quick flip through um, some lessons we've learned in the field. Again, um, you know, no one's paid us to talk about them, good or bad. These are just companies we track on a regular basis, ones that we feel that are, you know, really resonating with what the trends are, um, sometimes in ways that surprise us even. Um, but um, I think in general, our industry tends to be, oh, we didn't have enough sales, let's just drop the price 20% and go from there. Um, if you've looked at encoder prices, you know, they've eroded 20, 30% year over year. 
you can't really build a profitable industry uh, with a race to the bottom. Um, and so there, you know, there has to be a more sensible approach to creating value. And we have seen vendors who've been able to maintain, even increase their price points over time. Um, those who've chosen to compete on price have typically within three or four years started hurting enough that either they're out of the equation or they're acquired on a fire sale. Um, but you know, this is sort of going back to that market map, how are you going to move towards being central to the market conversation? How do you stay relevant as the market moves forward? Um, you're going to have to bite off the hard problems, the tier one customers and all the vendors. Um, very often we hear, well, you know, I solve this piece and then someone can figure out the rest or the system integrator can figure out the rest. Um, it's not going to happen that way. And if you wait for that to happen, you'll be one of that big crowd of vendors and you'll have no way to stand out. If you're going to stand out, you want to bite off the hard problem. Um, what you'll also see is that the hard problem will change over time. Um, you know, once upon a time, the hard problem was, can you take Windows Media, Flash, real networks, this format, that format, every format, and put it into AVC, and then put it out on Dash, HLS, HTTPS, this streaming, that streaming, this DRM, that DRM, that platform. That entire sort of mad combinatorical matrix has calmed down quite a bit. Um, you know, we're all centralized around AVC by and large. And so where a transcoding company once had to specialize in enabling niche workflows, now it needs to specialize in automated workflows. If there's an error, just fix it. You know, don't, don't break the workflow and wait for an engineer to intervene because I've got 250x the content. I can't deal with that anymore. Um, if, if there's a new profile, just you know, deal with it. If there's an error, deal with it. So those automated workflows are now far more important. And if you look at the transcoding market size, you know, it's kind of doing that. If you look at the automated workflow market, it's kind of doing that. You're going to have to reinvent yourselves, find the new hard problem, fix it. Um, case in point, Uyala, online video platforms used to be a big deal, um, you know, to get video, to get it online, to stream it. Um, today, any high school student can do it. So, you know, online video platforms in general mean nothing. Um, if you look at Uyala, it went from an OVP who did analytics to an analytics company who happens to have OVP. Their entire value proposition now is based on monetization and customer loyalty. That's the hard problem. That's what they're fixing. That's why they continue to be the star in their space. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this idea of chasing buzzwords. Because we're a buzzword-centric industry. You know, we build it and we hope people come. TV everywhere, SaaS. Uh, you know, having a transcoder with a video server is not a TV everywhere solution. Um, you know, if you cobble it together, you'll get traffic at your NAB booth, but that's pretty much it. And then you know, you'll create a nice trough of disillusionment for everyone else. Um, the same thing's happening with SaaS. Everyone wants to be in the SaaS space. Um, FFmpeg on Amazon Web Service is not a SaaS. Um, you know, it, it's like a water wheel, which as soon as the flood comes, it's going to smash. If you're going to build a hydroelectric power station, build a hydroelectric power station. Um, you know, don't just stick something in front of a stream. And it takes real engineering to make that long-term play. Um, and I love calling out the case of iStream Planet. Um, they were fairly early to the SaaS space. Their architecture is built from the ground up to understand that you're on this quicksilver network of computers that are going to go up and down. Right? The, the cloud as a virtualized environment is very different from a hardware FPGA. If you're going to take the software code from an FPGA-based encoder and just throw it onto Amazon, you're going to have worse scale than your customers. And that's, that's not a good recipe for success. So again, bite off the hard problems. You know, do it once, do it right, then you can scale and grow. Um, defining growth. Uh, very often we look at market share as, you know, how many units did I sell? How many channels did I sell? How many customers do I have? Um, and again, we're in a race to the bottom to just you know, hold on to market share by units. And you know, to some extent, I think analysts are responsible. That's how we report market share. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you want to build a profitable company. If you have $100 in revenue and $99 in costs, you might as well just sell $1 of product and you know, be done with it. Um, Apple is probably uh, you know, the nicest example to use for everyone who's saying Apple's losing market share. Um, bully for them, because even with the smaller market share, they make more money than everyone else combined. And so there is a case to be made for the commodity business. Um, just at that point, understand that you're entering the commodity business and need to structure yourselves that way. If you want to be in the business of innovation, then protect your bottom line, because you will need the R&D investments. 
Um, I will also say that adding revenue for a subscriber in the long run is more important than adding subscribers. Um, I love looking at Comcast's numbers quarter over quarter because invariably they will lose subscribers and they will increase profitability. Um, and they've been doing that, in my opinion at least, um, through a combination of how Xfinity is working online through very targeted advertising. Um, you know, they do really well on the advertising side. And eventually, I think for all content businesses, you're going to want to pay as much attention to advertising revenue per user as you do to average revenue per user. So that ARPU acronym is going to get more interesting. Um, we were looking at an online sports event. I can't really call out the people involved. They doubled their profits from going from a traditional broadcast to a broadcast plus OTT strategy. And we were talking in the tens of millions of dollars. This wasn't a small amount. So use that, you know, use it. Um, and it's as true for B2C as, you're, as in if you're a content provider as if you're a vendor. You know, if you're going to add SaaS subscribers, add them at a revenue price point that makes sense. You know, free is only going to get you so far and low cost will only get you so far. What we need, as we've seen, are these very industrial grade, end to end, holistic, always up systems. So build them and charge for them and then we can all move forward. Um, finally, content is still king, but it's only king if you can find it. Um, you know, I've had people say, oh, I've got 50,000 titles in my library. I'm so much better than Netflix. Um, do your users know you have them? Um, you know, are you the first page that they go to when they try to look for them? Do you know who your users are? Do you know what time of day it is? Do you know what device they're searching from? Do you know what they're likely? If you can't do that stuff, it doesn't matter that you have all the gold in your treasury because you're not using it. Um, it's the same thing with advertising. Um, for anyone who was watching Downton Abbey last January, I'm happy to admit I was, Carnival River Cruises, every ad break. By the time I was done with the season, I never wanted to hear the term Carnival Cruise again. Um, and so, you know, have, have an ad solution, but then have an ad inventory to back it up. Um, you know, it's a hard problem, but that's where your monetization is. And if you have a compelling ad experience, people will actually come to your service more because they like not just the content, but also the ads, and they're relevant, and they flow smoothly. So, um, you know, repeat after me, if there's one mantra I wanted to take away from this, it's analytics, discoverability, recommendation, personalization. If you can't recommend in personalized fashion, instant on, if it takes people, if you get halfway through dinner and you're still searching for a title, you've lost the TV opportunity, because toddlers are not patient creatures for those who have them. Um, and finally, um, I do want to say don't forget about piracy, as much to the vendors as to the content owners. As we start to move from hardware-based products to software-based products, our products become vulnerable to counterfeiting, to piracy, to license abuse. The same protections that you need on the content, you need on software-powered products as well. Um, I cover software monetization among you know, other things, and I was running a poll with encoder vendors saying, you know, 80% of you have shifted from hardware to software, what's your anti-piracy strategy? Yeah, we know we need to fix it. We haven't quite done that yet. Like, do you realize that you can take one image off of one server and distribute it everywhere? Yeah, you know, we don't think our customers are going to do that. Um, do you realize 80% of your market is outside the United States? Yeah. And so, you know, you start to connect those dots, make it a tier one problem. Make it a tier one problem, invest the resources, protect your IP, it will matter in the long run. Um, so this is sort of, you know, bringing everything back together. Again, you know, no one's paid us to talk about this particular company. I love this use case because it illustrates everything we talk about so well. Um, Digital Rapids, very well-known transcoding company. Um, Brick built up a great place. Um, they were very early into the cloud. Um, at some point of time, you know, you start to hit uh, issues with scale. Um, Harris, on the other hand, was very old school broadcast, you know, as atomistic hardware, technology-centric as you could get. Um, Harris decided to reinvent themselves, and they did it and how. So they went, they bought Imagine Communications, which was a smaller transcoding company, rebranded the entire company, hedged their entire future on IP-centric, open interface, um, very interoperable, very open cloud-based infrastructure. That leap in and of itself is a huge one. It's not a trivial one to make. Um, and you have to be smart about how you make it. But once that was done, they started adding all these individual pieces, and RGB networks, of course, came from the IPTV side. In its own right, again, very fixed, very product-centric offering. 
But you put those all together and then you marry the open TV advertising and suddenly you've got a company that's ready to help other people transform their businesses. I think Disney just announced at NAB that they're moving their entire production to the Imagine Cloud. Um, that's how you do it. You solve the big problems, you engineer it from the ground up, you build it for scalability, and then you solve the monetization and the reach problems for your customers and everyone moves one shift ahead. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Cool. First. Thanks. So uh, that brings us to, I'm just checking on time. Good. Uh, that, 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 uh, uh, a lot of things that Avni said, uh, I, I, I can't uh, emphasize them enough. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, there's a reason why Netflix keeps showing subscriber growth. There's been so much conversation about, oh, we've got cord cutters increasing. They're not going there because Netflix has a better content inventory. They're going there for the experience. Uh, Netflix knows me and says, oh, you're Mukul. You like campy 80s science fiction, um, so here you go. Uh, why do people go to Amazon to shop more than any other online retail site? Because it knows you. And that context that comes with marrying metadata to analytics, is, it's, it just cannot be overstated. Uh, but uh, really quickly, some of the typical challenges uh, for all of the different uh, uh, things that we have worked with, I've tried to summarize where we have been brought in to help with RFIs and stuff like that. One, very commonly what we see is uh, the systems are very siloed and disparate. We are seeing a lot of lack of collaboration between the creators. Uh, uh, when I was talking about the asset level activities and business level activities, uh, they, it, it, it really takes to move a mountain to have them work together. Uh, a lack of interoperability is huge because people, when they're buy, buying point solutions, they're doing that, they're buying point solutions. They're not thinking about, oh, I will need to tie my transcoder, uh, I'll, I'll have these mezzanine files, they'll be, have to, and we'll have to transcode them and then they go here, they go there. We, I'll need an OVP. What really is an OVP? Uh, no one, everyone hates that term. Uh, uh, I don't know if a single OVP who wants to be called an OVP anymore. Many of the really, really good ones are not even calling. Um, uh, Anwato case in point, excellent end-to-end um, uh, -end solution. Uh, they've never called themselves an OVP. Um, um, this, uh, cycle times are really, really wrong, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, 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 technology ownership. The business uh, manager understands it, needs that technology. Uh, there is a technocrat somewhere in the organization uh, always tasked with uh, doing too much with too little. And even once you have the technocrat on board, there's a bureaucrat who holds the purse strings who is asking if it ain't broke, why fix it? So you, you have those multiple stakeholders in the company and uh, just trying to deploy something, uh, uh, trying to figure out what does an emerging business model look like. As I said, a lot of people, and now they don't even have the luxury of experimenting anymore. You have so many people who are talking about, uh, oh yeah, my OTT strategy is creating a YouTube channel. Yeah, how is that working for you? Yeah, I'm getting incremental revenue. Uh, what about competition? As soon as you have uh, two-way interactivity, how, how, how sustainable is that? Uh, are you doing anything or are you just going to sit and wait for things to blow up in your face before you are going to react? Um, uh, the, the integration nightmares, everyone knows that. Uh, uh, and when you're looking at what the needs are, I mean, again, it goes back to those four buckets we had talked about earlier. Uh, having that sort of cent centralized content repository that is actually from creation to consumption, not as a point solution. Uh, searchability, uh, the user interface, uh, uh, having the workflows extremely col collaborative, uh, security is huge, can never, uh, always, uh, but the trouble with security is people, uh, Hollywood, for example, has no problem sending film across uh, with a messenger boy on a, s a bike uh, uh, across studios, but God forbid if uh, you're going to make a personal copy of that at home um, because of the Millennium Act and everything, uh, well, um, sorry, you can't do that. So how do you uh, strike a balance between security and usability? Because that user experience now is becoming that much more important. Uh, 
meaningful analytics and reporting of asset workflows, use it much monetization. And by meaningful analytics, the uh, only way that we have been able to figure out, and if you have a better way, do let us know. Uh, analytics on its own is uh, really nice. Uh, it's really powerful when you really marry it to metadata. Um, and the ba basically the ability to be on the maximum uh, uh, screens possible. And people keep asking us, you know, you know uh, where are we right now? Um, and if you go down this laundry, laundry list, we have everything. It, it is not that the technology is not available. You guys know it, all, all the vendors, I mean, you go through this, you're like, yeah, yeah, check, check, check. But why are the, uh, your customers struggling? And the reason is because we as an industry really have to come together and try and figure out, okay, I need to uh, move and try and serve that larger good of uh, uh, how does it all come together? How do we tie the dots to create those engaging business models to help uh, reduce churn to um, uh, help uh, uh, with subscriber growth rather than uh, worrying about how many, as of any very uh, so well articulated, you know, uh, how many uh, boxes I sold. And which brings us to just trying to bring it all together. You have the content management part, you have the uh, business management part, you have the experiences part, being able to leverage uh, um, uh, uh, cloud and very happy customer, which also is Chuck Norris approved. So that means it's really good. But yeah, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, um, I know it's just before lunch and everything, but uh, we do have a decent amount of time, maybe 10 odd minutes before uh, we break. So any questions? And uh, we have a crazy amount of experience that a lot of things we can't bake into the slides. So if there's any question we have not covered, that you would like to pick up brains about, we'd be more than happy to see what we can do with that. It's, it's a change management issue. And the thing is, what you're facing is uh, the, 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 the artifact of an internal, internally run turf war, right? Because uh, you have to realize over the years and people are struggling to find solutions, there are also places that many of the tier ones, they've tried to start uh, putting together with chewing gum something internally. You come in and say, hey, you know what? You don't have to go through that pain. There's a lot of budget that's going to vanish suddenly. So as I said, it's a change management issue. It's, uh, but the thing, the thing that we have found, and I, I was actually really, really surprised, especially globally, just hearing many of these, uh, well, agreed. A lot of it has come from tier twos. But even with tier ones, at least in certain, um, uh, departments, we are seeing uh, a much, it's gaining much more traction. Why are we doing this? This is, this is not a job. So they are getting there. It's slow, it's gradual, uh, but uh, the good news is it is happening. But in a nutshell, yeah, we are seeing a lot of those artifacts. And I think it also sits at the confluence of the middleware providers and the content service providers. Um, you know, very often interfacing is seen as a middleware issue. And so you may want to go talk to, especially a lot of the newer cloud-based middleware guys and see if there's some partnership options there. Actually, that's an excellent point because um, uh, what many of the middleware uh, uh, providers are trying to do uh, uh, for their pay TV customers is help them create not just on your uh, primary screen that same sort of uh, experience, but also translate that to unmanaged devices. That's really tough because now you're not tethered to uh, uh, that uh, managed device environment. As soon as you go into an unmanaged device environment, you have to leverage the cloud. And those middleware providers are trying to help uh, those pay TV operators to really get into the TV, enable the TV everywhere experience. But 
Anyone else? <coughs> Please. Are you seeing a, a shortage of coders on a worldwide basis, basis programmers in the, in the off markets in Asia and elsewhere? Are you seeing the same thing that we're seeing here in North America? Uh, for the technology building blocks? Uh, Uh, that are, that, you know, if we're talking about integrating these things and whatnot, that's going to be done by some of these programs. <coughs> but I'm just wondering from, uh, from your travels if you're seeing a, a market, you know, there's a lot of competition on that side, if you're seeing that same thing. Let me put it this way. Uh, for the past 15 odd years, I've met the same people with different business cards. So the people who know, they're very much in demand. And uh, the trouble is a lot of that uh, falls under the purview of many of the system integrators. Yeah. And that is a revolving door. And I'm sorry if there's a SI over here, but that is the truth. I mean, uh, every two years they're trying to rebuild everything that they tried uh, a couple of years back. So uh, there's constant poaching. And uh, it's very difficult to build that sort of domain expertise. A lot of them have been trying, some have been moderately successful at that. But sustaining that has been the biggest challenge. So the, yeah, the, they're few and far between. So do you think that's one of the core problems that leads to the, it not being an advantage to It does not help, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but you see the same thing all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and in fact, it's as much with you know, the actual deployments as it is with the vendors themselves. Um, you know, if you look at some of the largest transcoding companies, you ask them why they're concentrated in North America, they say they can't find field engineers outside and so they are starting to you know run their own universities uh, Bruce Devlin at Amberfin for example started the whole Bruce's shorts and trying to figure that out um, have training courses in how similar to what Microsoft and Cisco already do uh, you know there is a sense that this is now an operational industry and you're going to have to start to train people you're not going to get them straight out of college or you know <coughs> trained in a garage you're going to have to train them yourselves so the new DevOps is yeah yeah Please. Thank you. Uh, do you start to see any changes to uh, people putting up content as their shelf space as opposed to adding value in that process or consuming that content? Uh, if you look at long form content, movies or TV shows, uh, everybody today pretty much is a shelf space, like their not quite a streamer, but their great services is their shelf space. You put the content in there. You raise an excellent point. Do you see something really interesting start to go that way as opposed to the old way pretty much was in, you know, like look at movie consumption was in there for 100 years and the movie consumption model has not changed much. Excellent point. Okay, let's take Netflix, for example. Uh, or HBO or anyone, you know, you might use content as a hook, right? Uh, Game of Thrones. Fine, once Game of Thrones is over, what do I do? How are you going to retain me, right? I need to have the discovery. I need to explore the entire content library or I need to have a user experience. Netflix streaming, frankly, uh, I have uh, come to the end of their library in terms of what is valuable for me. Um, if you have not guessed already, it's 80s campy science fiction. Uh, how can you run out of that? But anyway, apparently we have. Uh, but at least this is very, very good discovery. So I can explore other genres. It is that capability that keeps me still as a subscriber. Because content is very important, but for the largest portion, if you look at most of the content providers, they have the same content. And we know that. Uh, I can't uh, uh, take the name, but uh, one of the largest, fastest growing uh, pay TV providers, and they were launching this service. We worked with them for three years, defining their entire watch strategy. We did a lot of benchmarking, including content, trying to figure out ARPU and everything. And one thing that we saw comparing all of the other pay TV providers, the content libraries were almost identical. So, uh, you know, uh, where do you go from there? And that really then gets into, well, I need to package that content in a certain way. 
Uh, it could be, uh, and I've seen some interesting companies uh, you know, uh, uh, who do contextual billing. They will look at metadata. So uh, just theoretically, if I'm Amazon, and uh, I've got all these Prime customers who are not really buying anything on demand, they're getting it with Prime, uh, and they can say that, okay, this person really likes this genre, I can look at that metadata and do contextual billing, and then say, hey, for five bucks more, I'll open this entire uh, other set of uh, the library for you, where they were making zero money, suddenly they're making at least five bucks off me, and then another a uh, couple of thousand people like me. So th uh, there is a lot of exploration right now, but yes, I could not have said it better. Uh, 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 whether you want to call it a shelving space or something like that, but uh, uh, you have to have content to draw people, but to keep people, you have to have that experience. Because even if you're differentiating on content, uh, that content is going to expire sometime. And to retain me, I need more than one hook. I need that entire experience. And that is where we are seeing a lot of people now gravitate towards, understanding that um, uh, in their own way, experimenting. Because right now, everyone is just dipping their toes. No one wants to charge in and make a huge mistake, especially the tier ones that you talked about. Uh, uh, but we are seeing a lot of uh, different things that are being tried out. Uh, there have been different deployments where we have seen, uh, especially when you look at ad insertion, for example, uh, let's say you've got three uh, generations in the same household, you've got the grandparents, parents, and children, uh, uh, through the ability to unicast everything, seeing how people are engaging with each of the three uh, uh, um, uh, screens uh, that each of those uh, demographics are doing, uh, looking at in the same household, being able to then intelligently insert ads uh, uh, that will be most relevant. The kids might be getting something about Mattel or Hasbro or something like that. Parents maybe about SUVs. Uh, the grandparents about buying or selling gold, I don't know. But the thing is they're going to try and get it as relevant as possible. Um, and that's where uh, the next phase of evolution, and that is, so when we showed the chart, uh, uh, why the market, con why that entire space, that upper right hand quadrant was getting so, um, uh, uh, crowded is those are the questions that are getting asked. And even if people don't have a solution, they're at least making the right sort of noises to say, well, uh, show me the money and I'll do that for you. Actually, no, you, I, I, I totally agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more, but as I said, so for example, if you take AT&T viewers, uh, uh, over a period of time now, they've started acting a whole lot of uh, interactive services to make that much more engaging, right? Uh, the big question mark is how do you translate that, uh, not just from an on-demand perspective, but also from a live linear perspective. Uh, something that uh, uh, Comcast has been working on with Xfinity, for example. So there, there are a lot of people who have come to that realization that, yeah, you know what, I, uh, the content 
everyone is trying to win the same content. Everyone has more or less the same libraries. There might be some difference here and there. But what can I do to engage my audience better? And uh, it's because of exactly what you said that we are seeing a lot of those rollouts gradually occur now in terms of the interactive services that they're trying to provide, the widgets that they're trying to provide with the services. But Yeah, you can go ahead and talk. So um, Media First, uh, which is uh, Media Room, which is bought by Ericsson, um, they're also exploring something very similar in terms of, you know, really unifying that multi-screen um, experience, making it transportable from screen to screen, keeping the social experience engaged with the TV. Um, there are also ad models that we've seen, not from Media First, from elsewhere, where what you're watching on the primary screen um, depicts uh, sort of drives what you see on your secondary screen during ad breaks, and so you tend to keep people more engaged. Um, that, that idea of multi-channel engagement is an important one. Um, it's a hard one because you're not necessarily tuned into the same services. And so, you know, having that meta layer, home media gateways for that reason are becoming more important because they are Wi-Fi routing everything to everyone so they can see more and they can do more. Um, but it's very much an unexplored territory. I think right now it's, again, probably more on the middleware side or the OTT developer side than it is, you know, any individual operator who's really made any big strides there. I think we are... Timing couldn't be perfect. I, I guess we're right at uh, the hour. Um, if uh, there's nothing else, I mean, you know where we live. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, um, I'm unfortunately flying out this afternoon. Otherwise, uh, yeah, w uh, when I'm at a watering hole, I end, end up saying stuff I shouldn't be saying. Uh, best time to ask me about dirty secrets in the market, but. Uh, yeah, please stay in touch. Uh, if there's anything at all, if there are other questions that you know, might crop up later, just let us know. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Thanks. Cool. Thank you.